Hey, how's it everybody? Thank you for having me. I am really, really feeling so much better right now. I'm struggling a little bit with the jet lag and the time difference from Kauai to over here. <laughs> but I'm feeling so much better right now. <laughs> and, and it's good to be back. This used to be um, our, my, my home church here with, you know, from Farrington. We're still at Farrington and uh, passed away and went kick us out. I mean, the Lord went send me to San Island. <laughs> And so this was our home church over here before uh, I, I moved on to Kauai. But uh, I, I grew up in Kalihi, Palama, and, uh, you know, really close to over here. And how many of you know that it's a risk to grow up in Kalihi? <laughs> yeah. You know, we, 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 we're going to be talking about risk. Yeah, it's a risk. And you, you know what, what? One of the biggest risks when I was a young boy uh, growing up in Kalihi was not getting caught at the chicken fights. And, uh, and uh, you heard Pastor Rod uh, alluding to a, a good friend of mine, Tenari. And I know Pastor Wayne is not here, but I'm going to ask you this question. Um, how you can tell on Samoan at one chicken fight? He the one carrying the duck. <laughs> how you can tell on Portuguese at one chicken fight? He the one bet on the duck. How you can tell the syndicate at the chicken fight? The duck win. <laughs> That's all you know, Hikali. Yeah, it's a risk. I mean, even the animals over there get attitude. <laughs> you know the Kali dog? The Kali dog, he don't bark like a regular dog. The Kali dog, you look at him, he go like this. Bow wow like that. <laughs> and, and you know, on Kauai, we have the Hawaiian owl, the Hawaiian owl, the puel. And I know there's some Hawaiian owls over here on this island too, but the Kali owl don't go, hoo, hoo. The Kali owl go, what, what? <laughs> yeah, so you know, <laughs> it'll be Kali, ba. And so we're going to be talking about risk. And you know, sometimes God is going to ask you and I to do things that just doesn't make sense. There's no logic to it. It doesn't fit in your schedule. It doesn't fit in your budget. Maybe you're 40 years old and the Lord says, go back to college. You'd be like, what? Uh, I don't think that's God. <laughs> or maybe the Lord said, go bless that person who did you wrong. The, oh, that's not God. <laughs> go financially bless someone who stole from you before. Oh, I don't think that's God. But God sometimes would say, you know, leave that secure, safe position and go take another position with less pay. You know, I remember uh, I was, before I got into ministry, I was with the airline industry for 18 years, right out of school, got into the airlines. And, and you know, uh, my wife also was with the travel industry, and we were doing good, both of us. Uh, I got the airline union kind of compensation, and we had our own house in Kalihi. We didn't have a mortgage and things like that. Everything was secure and safe, and then I got into ministry. Some of you might know that uh, it, pastor intern salary compared to airline union salary. And, uh, and then when we moved to Kauai, uh, from two incomes, we only had one income. So, so it was a risk. But, you know, if I had to do it again, I'll do it earlier. <laughs> because God is looking for risk takers. Amen? Amen? Because sitting here today are world shakers and history makers. But sometimes you're going to have to be a risk taker to separate the good from the great. Amen? Amen. And so we're going to be talking about that today, about getting out of our comfort zone and walking to God's miracle zone. And we're going to be looking at some scriptures because, you know, you and I, we, we can talk ourselves out of taking a risk for the Lord. We debate, we, 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 we argue, and then next thing you know, we don't do it. A lot of you know people, I know people that they take no risk, so they gain nothing, and they wonder why they have nothing. And so we don't want to be that way when the Lord says, okay, you're going to take a risk for me, and I'm going to take you from one place to another that you've never been before. But you're going to have to step out of your comfort zone and walk into the miracle zone. Amen? Amen. So we're going to look in today's scripture. Now, uh, I know in your bulletins and the scripture looks kind of a lot, so forgive me for that. We, you know, we're, we're not filling in the blanks today because Kauai people get a hard time filling the blanks. <laughs> That's why when you ask us one question, we look at you, we don't blank. So, but just kidding, just kidding. I, 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 know, there's a, I know there's a lot of scripture over there, but we're going to set it up, okay, before we get right into the scripture. Okay, good. Now, this is a miracle about Jesus walking on the water, okay, and we're going to look at Peter too. Now, prior to this great 
awesome miracle. Jesus did another great miracle right before this. What he did was he took five loaves of sweet bread and two dry coolie and he fed them all to two, okay? <laughs> and now in Matthew 14, 22, it's not in your bulletins. You can look it up in your Bible or go home and look it up. It says this now. It says that Jesus, right after feeding the multitude, he made the disciples go into a boat and told them, go to the other side of the shore. He made them, the Bible says. Now, a lot of us know that God really doesn't make us do anything we don't want to do. They could have said no, but he made them. The Bible, the interpretation I, I looked at it says made. In fact, I looked up that word in the old Hebrew, and the word made means made. Okay? <laughs> so I just save you a lot of time. And, 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 and <laughs> hey, whoo, all the Portuguese go, I get them now, and over the head, and now, now. Okay, that's why we need backboard. Okay. So he made them now get in the boat, okay? Knowing very well that boat was headed into a storm. Come on, somebody. It was a divine setup now. Okay, now, it also says this, that Jesus says, I'm going to dismiss the people, you go. Okay, I'm going to dismiss them, you go. It's like Pastor Wayne telling his leadership, okay, I'm going to dismiss the people, I'm going to break down, I'm going to clean up, you guys go. He'd be like, no, we're going to help you break down, we're going to help you clean up. He says, no, no, you get in this boat and, you, and, and go. Okay, so he made them go, knowing very well this boat was headed for a storm. It was a divine setup. Come on, somebody. And then now let's look at the scripture that we have in our bulletins today. And then it, it begins like this. Now we're going to break it down by, uh, paragraph by paragraph and verses by verses. And we're going to take a good look at this. It says this. It says, Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Now when it says here, the fourth watch, and some of you may know this, this is a Roman clock schedule for night watches. The fourth watch was the last watch, usually from 3 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the morning. How many of you know that 3 o'clock in the morning is usually the darkest time of the night? How many of you are so blessed that Jesus comes at the darkest time and he comes the brightest for us? Amen? Amen. And so when everything was dark, in the, it had to be the darkest time of the storm. When Jesus shows up. Is it, isn't it true when we're in a storm and it's the darkest that Jesus comes and be the brightest for us? Because that's the kind of God we serve. Amen? Amen. And then it goes on to say this now. It says, But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. <coughs> now everybody turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus said, It is I. Okay? Now remember that. Okay? It is I. Because what we're about to see next in the next verses is that we're going to see that Peter has a disease, the same disease I had for a long time from a very young age, a young, called foot in the mouth. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Otherwise known as thinking without, speaking without thinking. So he almost did that. Speaking without thinking. He has his foot in his mouth, and Peter was known for that. Because we're going to see why. Now look what it says here. It says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, Jesus just said, it is I, right? And Peter goes, if it is you, Jesus could have gone, bro, I just told you it was me. <laughs> right? He goes, if it is you. Now, how many times have you and I done this and said, Lord, if it is you, let this happen or that happen? God already gave a confirmation, and he says, yes, yes, that's me, I'm there. And we go, if it is you, Lord. And sometimes we can get ridiculous in that. I, I know I've done it in the past. I said, Lord, you know, I'm a, I had a certain very, very important thing I was praying about. I said, Lord, if it is you, let my dog talk. <laughs> you did them with one donkey, you can do them with my dog. And so I look at my dog, and he go, bow out like that. Or sometimes we go, Lord, if it is you, if this is the person you want me to marry, have them call me exactly at 7.15. <laughs> and then we look at, oh, 7.16, 7.20, 7.30. Ah, give them a little bit more time, Lord. Maybe they stay on Kauai time. <laughs> but a lot of times we do that, right? We say, Lord, if it is you. And God already said, it is I. But you know, interesting what Peter was doing right here was he was calling Rhema, the spoken word of God, into Logos, the written word of God. 
You know what Peter was saying right here? He said, he's asking the Lord to tell him to do something he could never do on his own. It had to be God. Come on, somebody. Peter is asking God to tell him to do something he could never do on his own. And he's asking for a word. How many of you know if you just get one word from God, it'll change your life forever? Just one word can turn your whole eternal destiny around. And that's what happened with Peter because it says this. As we go on to read on the next paragraph, it says, So he said, come, just one word. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Now the Lord says, now Peter goes, okay, Lord, if it is you, tell me to do something I cannot do. And the Lord gave him one word, come. Just one word, come. And you know, it goes on to say that Peter started to take his eyes off the Lord and looked at the storm instead of the one who calms the storm and started to sink, right? Because that's what happens to you and I. We could be walking in the midst of a miracle. We perhaps it's the miracle of salvation. And we start to take our eyes off the Lord. And then we begin to sink. And we begin to focus on the storm instead of the one who comes the storm. And though he starts to sink now, yes, we can blame Peter for sinking. But at least he got out of his comfort zone to walk into the miracle zone. At least he tried to walk like Jesus instead of cowering in his safety place. Come on, somebody. I'd rather be trying to walk like the Lord even though sinking. But at least I got out of my comfort zone and I stepped into the miracle zone. Peter is the only other person outside of Jesus in the history of mankind to defy the elements and science and walk on water. Come on, somebody. That only happened because he decided to walk out of his comfort zone and step into the miracle zone. And you know, when I look at this scripture and I say, wow, you know, Peter, when, he, Peter, when he's getting out of the boat now, if you was Peter, I don't know, how would you get out of the boat? Would you just jump out and go, ta-da, oh, wow. Or, or maybe would you be like me? I'd be like this. I'd be like, okay. Oh, 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 oh. oh. But you see this moment right here? Is when you and I have one foot in the word and one foot still in the world. Come on, somebody. And sometimes we catch ourselves still trying to be in our comfort zone and trying to walk into the miracle zone. Amen? Amen? Now let's look at this. And I, I like to think, you know, I wonder what happened when Peter was going through this and he's getting ready to step out of the boat. Let's look at the cast of characters that was with him, still in the boat. <laughs> Who was that? That was the leaders. That's the leadership. That's Pastor Wayne's Fractal. That's Pastor Rod and Pastor John Tilton, still sitting inside him. <laughs> Tell everybody, you go, you, you go. Just kidding, my brother. But that was the leaders, right, in there. Now, as Peter's stepping out, I, I, I try to think, I go, I wonder what is being said. Maybe Andrew, his brother, went and go, hey, Peter, something happened. I can't have the boat. <laughs> Maybe the tax collector was going, I hope you didn't sign the living will I told him about. <laughs> Thomas be like, he'll never make it. <laughs> Judas be like, let me hold your wallet. But whatever took place, he got away from, from those that were secure in their safety place. And he says, no, I'm going to be the one to step out of my comfort zone and into the miracle zone. Amen? Amen. Now, it goes on to say this. He says, now, he started to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. No, Lord, save me. The, at least Peter knew enough to cry out to the Lord. How many of you know it's important? When you and I are sinking in the midst of storms, is to cry out to our Savior because that's who He is, the one who comes and saves, especially in the midst of our storms. It was us who took our eyes off of the Lord. We look at the storm instead of the one who comes the storm. And then we begin to sink in our walk with the Lord. But then if we cry out to Him, isn't it great? That, no, this is what happens right here. It says, And immediately Jesus stretched out His hand and caught Him and said to Him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Now it says, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand. Isn't it so great that the Lord would stretch his hand out in the midst of your storm to catch you and grab you? 
because that's the kind of Lord we serve. Now, when I look at this, what Peter crying out, and Jesus says, oh, you little faith, he says, Lord, help me, save me. And the Lord saves him. Now, I know it was a physical rescue or saving, okay? Because from drowning. But, you know, I kind of also believe you're spiritual too. Let me tell you why. Now, Peter, now, who was Peter? Okay, who was Peter? Peter was a fisherman, right? That's what he did. That, that was his livelihood. He was a commercial fisherman. That was his life, amen? amen. He wasn't a weekend leisure fisherman who go sometimes gets Owama and whip for papil. Come on, somebody. <laughs> right? This was, this was his job. <laughs> this, was, this was his livelihood. And, uh, and, you know, I like to study Peter because he says he was an unlearned fisherman. That's mean he wasn't that bright. So I can relate to him. My mother used to tell me, no get smart, so I never. <laughs> so now Peter is a commercial fisherman, right? That's his livelihood. That's what he did his whole life, right? I don't know any commercial fisherman in the world that owns his own boat and doesn't know how to swim. Come on, somebody. Right? Because Jesus could be like, come on, bro. Hey, hey, hey. Tread water a little bit, bro. Start kicking. Come on, you can do it. It's like Sandy's makapu, why man, when he speaks. Come on, you can do it. You can at least get back to the boat. Because we know that Peter knows how to swim, right? Because at the end of the Gospels, Jesus is cooking on the seashore. Peter jumps off his boat. And what, what does he do? Swims to the shore. He knew how to swim. That's why I'm kind of thinking, when he said, save me, Lord, he wasn't just saying, save me physically. He said, save me spiritually. Save me from my doubt. Save me from my unbelief. Save me from myself. Save me from not looking at the storms, but he who calms the storm. Come on, somebody. And the Lord re reached down and saved him and grabbed him. And you know what it says? Is that when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. The storm stopped. The same boat that Jesus made them get into and head into the storm. See, sometimes God will divinely set us up because you can't get a miracle unless you're in a mess. Come on, somebody. You can't see a promise unless you got a problem. And a lot of times when we have a storm in our life, we like to blame the devil and a lot of times it's not him. Sometimes it's the Lord setting us up for something great. But unless we get out of our comfort zone, we'll never walk into the miracle zone. And that's what happened to Peter over here. Isn't it awesome that we serve a Lord that not just sets us up for failure, but it's always for success? Because see, if God brings you to it, he'll bring you through it. Amen? Amen. And that's the kind of God we serve. But we have to take risk. We got to be a risk taker to be a world shaker and a history maker. Unless we step out of our, we don't step out of our comfort zone into the miracle zone, we'll never see or experience these things. And what we learn from Peter is, yeah, we can point the finger to him for sinking. But at least he tried to walk like our Lord by getting out of his safety zone into the miracle zone. Amen? The best part is when they got back in the boat, the wind died. Because when Jesus is in the midst of the boat, that's when the storm comes. It goes on to say this now in our last verse here. It says, Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I'm going to close with this. Now, we're not always going to understand when God asks us to do something that has risk involved. It doesn't make sense. There's no logic to it. It doesn't fit in our schedules. It doesn't fit in our budget. But maybe today God is asking some of us to take a risk. Maybe just coming to church today or every Sunday is a risk for some of us. It's stepping out of our comfort zone into God's miracle zone. Maybe just starting to read your Bible every day. Maybe start to pray. Maybe joining a small group or leading a small group is a risk of getting out of your comfort zone into the miracle zone. Maybe just becoming a tither is a risk to some of us. Maybe you might call it a financial risk, but God is setting you up in a divine setup for miracles and blessings because you can never outgive God. Come on, somebody. Maybe God is asking you to serve today. 
somewhere in his kingdom in his church. Whether it's passing out a bulletin, pushing a chair, plugging a wire. Just get involved in serving in God's kingdom. Maybe you're thinking, well, that doesn't fit my schedule. But God is saying, if you're going to step out of your comfort zone, you're going to walk into my miracle zone. And you're going to have to take a risk. Because risk takers become world shakers and history makers. Amen? Amen. If you're going to be victorious, now get this. Where are the best fruits in life? Always out on a limb. Sometimes we got to stop hugging the tree. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Amen? Amen? How many of you received that today? Let us pray. Epulikako. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and thank you for your word. We pray that you would give us the courage and the strength, Lord, to be risk takers for you. That we'd be willing to become out, out from our comfort zone and into the miracle zone. Lord, help us to not focus on the storm, but he who calms the storm. We give you all the honor and all the praise, Lord. We want to be victorious in you. And we know it involves risk a lot of times. If we want to get out and walk on water, we got to get out of the boat again. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for having me.